What's up, QAA listeners? The fun and games have begun. I found a way to connect to the internet. I'm sorry, boy. Welcome, listener, to chapter 216 of the QAnon Anonymous podcast, the 1600s QAnon episode. As always, we are your hosts, Jake Rokotansky, Julian Fields, and Travis View. This week, we're going back in time to the 1600s to explore conspiracy theories in the advent of the printing press, a new and exciting form of mass media that ended up bending human brains in unexpected ways. We'll be talking about Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation, and the Thirty Year War. To delve into the topic, we're joined by Chris Wade and Matt Chrisman of the Chapel Trap House podcast and their newly launched series, Hell on Earth. Welcome, fellas. Hey, thanks for having us. What's up, guys? So before we get too esoteric, like into Rosicrucianism and, and, and the like, I thought it might be useful to just paint a little picture of a guy in history, this guy being Martin Luther. I think we say in the show that he is history's first poster in the modern sense, in that he arrived at the same time that print media was transforming the social landscape of Europe, and unlike anyone before, was able to intuit exactly what a mass audience wanted to hear and how they wanted to hear it. And then he just started posting like a madman. So hard that he broke uh, (laughs) the entire continent in half. Uh, Yeah, Martin Luther started off life as the son of a miner, a uh, copper miner with a small uh, concern in kind of uh, the Saxony region of Germany. And he was going to become a lawyer to improve his family's status, but then he almost got struck by lightning on the road to school one day and decided that if God would spare his life from a lightning strike, he would become a monk, which he did. He uh, got into an Augustine monastery and from there started reading the Bible and from there started saying, hey, a lot of stuff that's going on in the Catholic Church uh, doesn't really seem to be found anywhere in the Bible. And uh, he was a bit of an academic, a bigot of a nerd, and he was trying to get some people to debate him, bro, uh, by putting out these calls for academic (laughs) disputation. And one of them was a uh, packet of 95 uh, small doctrinal quibbles on the practice of selling indulgences in central Germany. And uh, his quibbles got out into the Mm -hmm. public, and suddenly a lot of people wanted to read them very quickly. And they became an immediate printing sensation. And from there, uh, my man just did not stop writing in the most argumentative fashion possible uh, of, in his age. And from there, basically split the church in two just from the power of his pamphlet writing. Yeah. And it, what, his first attempt to get a disputation going was on abstract questions of like scholastic theology and like uh, faith. Uh, justifying yeah. or you know works justifying faith and that was a snooze no one really cared it was when he was started talking about indulgences and talking about popular practices that had monetary relationship to people that uh, folks in the cities of germany started really paying attention so i guess the equivalent is like a poster who gets obsessed with uh, a game that's pay to win and he's like these indulgences people are basically paying and then they just get into heaven that doesn't make any sense and he's pointing out these hypocrisies meanwhile i spent 400 hours leveling my <laughs> leveling my character up to up to uh faithful well you should have uh, bought the the heaven gems <laughs> I, I i i spent all of my dollars to go to the nearest church pilgrimage and look at the saint eustace's shin bone that that got my grandpa <laughs> off 19 million years at purgatory I, that, that doesn't mean anything now so he's pointing out contradictions in this big institution. Is is the Catholic Church basically the the only representative of Christendom that has any real influence in that region, or are there other competing interests? And how do Martin Luther's ideas kind of change the paradigm? I mean, the closest thing to any uh, challenge to the Catholic authority in, in that part of Europe was the Ultraquist Church in Bohemia, where uh, that had fought a sort of a proto-Reformation uh, like a, a, a century earlier uh, behind a guy named Jan Hus, uh, which means goose. <laughs> and th- they, they invited mm-hmm. him to a church uh, conclave w- with a promise of safe passage and then burned his ass. The goose was literally cooked. But his followers sta- staged a, a, a decades-long military conflict against uh, papal authorities and were able to carve out a special dispensation for their own church, which is basically Catholicism plus the Czech language plus getting bread and wine at communion instead of just the bread, which has been one of the big things that they okay, have fought yeah. over. But other than that, the Catholic Church was hegemonic. But yeah, and the real thing is, is that there have been periodic 
movements to to try to win these concessions, to try to reform the church from within. Uh, but one of the things that prevented it from actually going anywhere was the lack of mass media, the yeah. lack of a printing technology, the lack of communication. So basically the only people that you could get on your side were the people that you could go from town to town and actually tell about your ideas. And if you're just one guy doing that, uh, and the Catholic Church is a massive infrastructure of control and enforcement, it becomes pretty hard to get a uh, mass movement of reform going. And what makes Luther... Uh, you know, able to do this is both his <laughs> combative and prolific personality coming at right the same time when there is enough of a printing infrastructure available to spread his word far and wide beyond his own uh, uh, initiative. Right, because I, I imagine at the time, you know, it's not the best look in the world if you're a crazy guy on a box yelling in a town square. You know, you might have a, a handful of people around but, you know, it's much different when somebody is reading something, you know? Well, you, you would say that because the, the crazy guy, the last cool crazy guy out of town square, you guys killed. <laughs> you yes. Jewish people. You took care of huh? Jesus. <laughs> he was well, a- hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's not, bring, let's not bring it up old shit, okay? <laughs> you know, I'm interested in this idea that this network of printing presses is essentially like an early internet. Like, how did it spread and who controlled it and, and how did things kind of propagate? across them like how would you go and read the boards well so there was a well-established printing economy in germany at the time probably the it's the, it, the most well-established in europe at that point but uh there was not a mass audience for printed material for the most part uh, most printers made their nut on government documents and things like indulgences. The economic uh, proposition of publishing a new book was incredibly risky because you had to, you were essentially betting that you could sell X number of books. And then if you didn't, you were ruined. <laughs> so printing was, it was a growing and viable uh, economy, but it was also very, very risky. And there was a reticence to put too much uh, investment in. Gutenberg, the guy who invented the thing, went fucking bankrupt. Uh, it, was, it was very risky to, to publish new books because no one know, knew what people wanted to read. Uh, and what Luther's call did of saying, hey, the church is lying to you. Your soul is not saved by buying an indulgence or looking at uh, you know a, a, a twig from the burning bush and some some guy's uh, cathedral, you know, the, the Bible is, the word is your only salvation. Uh, in a time when religion made up popular culture, they were totally inextricable. It created a market for the first time, a huge market for printed material. And the printers of Germany met that moment and started putting out anything that Luther put uh, published, and it all sold. And so that created demand, not just for more stuff from Luther, who was happy to provide it who, because he was a writing machine, but also uh, people who came in Luther's wake and were trying to extend and, uh, uh, and continue the critique that he'd started. And also people uh, disputing Luther. I mean, it was public flame wars, people uh, writing against his tracks, people writing for, for him. You could, re- you, you know, I mean, we're very much, you know, overtly making the, all these internet analogies because we're trying to make this moment relevant now but it is very recognizable in the same type of things that people like to uh boil their brains reading online is people saying something crazy and then a bunch of other equally crazy people say uh arguing with them except this is about something that people actually believed in which is the fate of their immortal souls and the catholic authorities at the time were always noting to each other in chagrin that the catholic responses to luther just got wiped out in the book stalls nobody was buying them relative to the to the protestant stuff it's just like the mark what people wanted to hear was the the criticism what they wanted to hear was this uh, alternate idea uh, of what a shock you know to an illiterate audience telling them you don't need to do all this expensive for one thing stuff you can read a book you can read the bible which uh, Luther, when he was imprisoned, uh, imprisoned, quote unquote, by uh, Frederick the Wise for his own protection, he started writing a German translation of the Bible almost immediately, and that became one of his big projects. And so uh, people uh, took to it. And funnily, Wittenberg, the town he was from, only had one printing press, and it was essentially a vanity project of the elector. And when Luther starts writing, uh, there isn't any way that they can meet the demand. And so uh, Luther's stuff starts getting printed in other cities in in Germany, and they in those cities where those books are published, they create this cycle of capital formation where books get sold, 
uh, the profits are put back into publishing, which means more books get sold, which means the publishing uh, economy grows, and you have entire cities that become uh, based on publishing as their economic engine. And so you have, you know, I guess like the general population more and more discussing these ideas and going, well, I agree with Luther. Well, I don't or whatever. And how does that that conversation develop and uh, as well alongside the technology? Because if I understand it correctly, eventually they had like portable printing presses. Uh, yeah, I mean, the portable, the, at least what I've read, the portable printing presses were usually used on campaigns as basically propaganda. Uh, military campaigns is basically propaganda tools is like you would you know if you were an elector or duke or something you were going out in the field you would bring along a portable printing press so as soon as you won you could get the news of your victory out into the uh into the market and hopefully you know affect the willingness of of people to fight either for you or against you but you know even as this technology is developing you know, people are diversifying it. And so within, you know, a generation of Luther starting to write, you have enough of an appetite. You've trained people to want a continual flow of information, of printed materials enough that it becomes sustainable to do, uh, let's say, weekly broadsheets that describe current events and news of your locality, uh, you know, your your, your immediate locality, a, a kind of uh, newspaper, you know. Uh, so it, it's, it's training his work and, and the passion put around his theological logical writings trains an audience to desire printed materials of other kinds of information that spurs on this information revolution in the in the 17th century and creates an entirely new subjectivity like who an individual is in relation to other people goes from being largely a concrete network of personal relationships to these abstracted communities who you only know about through the uh, printed material you're reading, but who become as real to you as the people that you see every day. So why does Martin Luther, like, essentially win this flame war? Or at least, you know, I mean, it seems like the only message board was just, it just said God, that was the topic. And, <laughs> yes. and, then, and so, like, how does he become, like, you know, top dog, top poster and start to really shift things? Well, I would say that the first the first board top t- topic is God, and then the second board created is electoral politics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and one of the things that that really uh that really takes it to the next level is because of the specific context of his writing the holy roman empire which is you know this i we can't even really get into it but this absolutely byzantine collection of tiny polities uh you know ranging from little more than just like a a guy's house with a wall around it to like vast vast swaths kingdoms basically Mm -hmm. and they're all ruled by different people of different noble uh levels and Overall, it's ruled by the Catholic Holy Roman Empire in the personage of the Habsburgs. But all of these little electors, these princes, these dukes, they want more power. They want more autonomy. And suddenly there is this new uh, there's this new ideology present that can get you a little independence from your Catholic emperor. And that is this Protestant faith, this Lutheranism. And so pretty quickly, it is the Lutheran ideology is adopted by these kind of middle scale nobles to advance their own personal and political interests and independence and gaining more privilege against the emperor. And he is brought on as basically a a princely project uh, that is used to advance Lutheranism, which is one of the main ways that it survives through its initial first generation of of, uh, the movement. Yeah. And the thing that makes it viable until they start uh, deciding to make this shift is that as soon as these things start getting published and put out, uh, the educated, uh, literal people in the towns of Germany, northern Germany, uh, start spontaneously trying to reform the churches on their own. They, they, they read it and they're like, this is true. And so they start pushing against Catholicism at the, at the town level. Uh, and that becomes something that no sovereign can really control. Uh, and even the princes who might be wary of rocking the boat... Uh, end up kind of going along uh, in order to not come into too direct conflict with their own subjects. Because once this gets out, uh, and the printing technology is what allows that to happen, uh, once it breaks the containment of of, uh, academic dispute, uh, it becomes essentially uh, like a wildfire. Uh, And in the specific context of the Holy Roman Roman Empire, you have these princes who are willing to let the fire burn because it means more power and influence for them. It means more money for them because all that money to indulgences is draining out of their principalities. It's all going to Rome Rome, and going into the coffers of the local uh, appointed bishops. Uh, This gets them and and for the, the townspeople. Uh, 
Uh, this means no more having to tithe, no more having to spend all this money on masses for your dead uncle. Uh, it's a promise of a cheaper church, too. I mean, that has that material uh, motivation also. And these, these forces, like, they bring together the towns and uh, the princes in seeing the value of, uh, of challenging the, the uh, emperor and the pope on it. And the Holy Roman Emperor simply does not have the state capacity to enforce his will on uh, electors and princes who don't want to have it enforced on them. I wanted to talk a little bit about how most people, when thinking about Protestantism, especially in like the modern context, they don't really associate that with secularism. But this was kind of a form of secular movement that formed a whole new version of Christianity? Could you, can you explain like how that works? Well, I mean, first you're breaking, uh, Lutheranism like breaks the universal church. It says that there, can be, there is no one religious authority. It, the highest religious authority is now the, the local sovereign. Uh, and Luther sees in the local sovereign the, uh, the the repository of justice. He didn't he didn't trust or like most princes, but he felt they were necessary to maintain the order that could allow the the good word to spread and to allow people to have that transformative relationship. That 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 that, that moment of reckoning that he had on the toilet, where he realized that uh, grace is all, and and that God's grace is 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 you know ineffable. Uh, but it was really uh, the people who came later uh, into the west of him. The Swiss reformers like uh, Zwingli and then Calvin, whose conception of reformed Christianity created a permanent split between the secular authorities and religious, because they said, unlike Luther, no, the, the head of the church should not be uh, the local sovereign. The head of the church should be the members of the church. Uh, 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 pastors and church officials should not be appointed by a prince. They should be elected and chosen by the laity themselves. And that is where modern so, uh, uh, secularism starts, is in that uh, conception that was uh, not coincidentally forged in a place where there really weren't any princes. Because at this time, the Swiss Confederation had, for hundreds of years, had de facto independent. They were technically part of the Holy Roman Empire at this point, but they had had hundreds of years of de facto independence because they were up in the mountains. What are you going to do? And they really knew how to use a halberd. They were, <laughs> they were really good at halberding. Yeah. And so they got to do mm -hmm. what they wanted. And by the time of the Reformation, most of the cities in uh, Switzerland were essentially independent city-states or had recently gained their independence, like Geneva had recently thrown off the rule of the, the Dukes of Savoy. Uh, and so to them, the idea of a fully... Uh, laity controlled church made much more sense and that's the one that that's the conception of protestantism that sort of metastasizes across western europe whereas lutheranism really does kind of stick into northern germany and scandinavia yeah and then would you look at that where does uh calvinism immediately spread to uh the dutch republic which is similarly a place that had long uh, divorced itself from kind of a princely rule that was much more of a merchant confederation and it's you know it's not a coincidence that these are the two places where this uh church divorced from secular authority uh, develops and it also for the Dutch gives them the the uh, social fuel to overthrow what they do have, which is uh, overlordship by the Spanish. Uh, yeah, and and they are they start an eighty years war to gain independence from Spain uh, from these powerful merchant cities like Amsterdam. Yeah, that's really. That's really interesting. I wanted to go back a little bit to Martin Luther as a man, as a poster. You know, obviously when you post and, you know, you go big, you want to have certain quirks, right? And like in his case, it's he was an ass man. He was obsessed <laughs> with the anus and with shitting. So you said, you know, he had his epiphany on the toilet. Uh, I mean, what, you know, what do you what do you make of that? Can you tell us a bit more about that aspect of him? That aspect of him. <laughs> uh, he just, he loved himself a crap based metaphor. He talked about making the devil smell his shit a lot. <laughs> Uh, when he was an older man and he felt like he was on his last legs, he said, I, I am a stool uh, and the world is a giant anus trying to pass me. Yeah, I mean, he, it is. It, I think it does speak to his what would be <laughs> what would be attractive to him is that there was a, a very human quality to his writing. And it wasn't these magisterial proclamations from a, uh, you know, a princely representative of God in Rome. It was a guy who was recognizable in his words and style as just another guy you might meet on the streets in Germany. Yeah, who, who was surrounded by shit, as everyone was in an in, uh, early modern city. Uh, yeah, because Luther put his own torment on the page and his own humanity uh, out there because he was deeply 
uh, he had a deeply uh, fraught relationship with his faith. He never felt saved. He, he, he knew his own heart well enough to doubt whether God could ever uh, accept him. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that he was so made so uh, uh, anxious and, and upset by the pretensions of the Catholic uh, Church is because he could not imagine that just going through these motions uh, could possibly be enough to save a wretch like him. Uh, and so that's why he, he ended up only being able to square that with his uh, embrace of grace. But even that was filled with contradictions. And his, his way of dealing with his own anxiety and neuroses was to constantly work through the contradictions in his thought. And it was the way that soothed, it, like it was, it was what soothed his uh, mania. Uh, but, you know, it also erupted in constant anger, constant uh, uh, violent interpretations of anyone who disagreed with him, and lots of uh, scat and shit metaphors. I mean, he was spent his entire life basically trying to pass an idea through the anus of his mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was also debilitating, actually, like, debilitatingly constipated for basically yeah. his entire adult so life. So that definitely had... Yes. Uh, that's yeah. a reason it was on his mind. His, 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 his <laughs> brain was on his bowels for a, lo for a lot of his life. <laughs> that gives you a lot more time to, like, write, you know? You don't have, yes. to, you don't have yeah. to sit there like an idiot and shit. So, okay, so, like, obviously, you know, that's that's his panache was the ass stuff, but but, you know, like, any good guy arguing stuff online you have to come up with some bad guys and you have to come up with a couple of little spicy conspiracy theories just to add a little pizzazz so like what you know who who were the bad guys who were like what was this the, the idea of a crypto catholic and um you know like how did this kind of belief system i guess like around him develop during luther's life it was mostly just the catholics although um it, it's mostly like a generation later after uh you know, Protestantism had been go a going concern in places that were reformed, where the church had, be had been reformed and sp split away, where this uh, paranoid, often paranoid, sometimes justified idea of crypto-Catholicism uh, came up. Uh, and one of the places that you see it most fervently is in England, uh, where after the church is reformed, and especially after the brief moment where Mary comes to the throne in the 1650s and tries to re-Catholicize England and then only reigns for, what, like five years or something like that? And then Elizabeth comes on and basically seals the deal on the English Reformation, they enter what is essentially a a century of a kind of red scare like panic that anywhere lurking behind any door was a network of secret Catholics who would at any given moment possibly emerge in mass to encircle the the delicate uh, flowering of Protestantism in the island and, and uh, you know do great violence to restore Catholicism uh, and this this goes on you know up through the middle of the 17th century and it, it's really an animating uh, factor of of fear paranoia and motivation for a, a lot of the reformers to move even further into the uh, more radical edges of their of their reform and in the idea of we we need to do it first before they do it to us yeah and there's even a there is a structure to it it's not just you know you it's the church itself and it's the form of it's the it's the uh, the Pope who becomes Antichrist in the conceptions of the Protestants. Like Luther starts off thinking that he can reason with the Pope, and then once the Pope doesn't agree with him, he's like, "Oh, Antichrist." Uh, <laughs> that was uh, Luther's general attitude. He would he was always assuming that if you read the Bible and you read what he wrote about it, that you would come to the same conclusions as him. And then when that failed to happen, then it meant that you were a uh, dupe or a liar or, or a demon or the devil. Yes. Uh, the, you see that with his relationship with Jews. Uh, in his first early writings about uh, Jews, uh, he's actually uh, pretty sympathetic. He says, of course they're not Catholic. Of course they're not Christians. Why would you be? Why would you leave your traditional faith and your community's faith for this corrupt whore of Babylon church? But when Jews persisted in continuing to be Jewish, now that they had the option of being Protestant, he starts writing really terrifyingly, hair-raisingly, anti-Semitic screeds about how they need to be, uh, that they're you know a, a danger in the midst of Christendom and that they need to be wiped out. Yeah, I guess that when the Jews like you know didn't subscribe for five bucks a month or whatever, he was like, you know, that's, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's like, well, fuck you then. But in, in Europe, in Germany specifically, in a, where... The Reformation becomes this Cold War where you have these uh, porous borders between the places where Protestantism has been established and places where the Catholic Church still runs. You have this process once uh, of, of counter-Reformation, once the Church sort of gets its act together, 
to sort of push back against uh, the Reformation. Uh, and like in mm-hmm. Habsburg lands in, in southern Germany and Austria, places that had been Protestantized over, over the first generations of the, of the Reformation were targeted for uh, counter-Reformation and for re-Catholicization. And the people who did it were the Jesuits of the Society of Jesus, which had been essentially uh, created, it had been created by Ignatius Loyola uh, as a way to you know, purify the church and, and bring together laity towards its advancement, but then was instrumentalized by the papacy as an instrument of papal uh, authority. Uh, and you saw Jesuits coming into towns that had been Lutheran uh, and bring back all the old uh, parades and festivals and feast days that had been wiped off the books. And that process did give, in the minds of a lot of German Protestants, the idea that the Jesuits were this secret organization that was working day and night to undermine true religion wherever it could be found. And so, you know, before we jump into the kind of QAnon aspect of all of this and like the secret pamphlets and anonymous posters, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the topic of your podcast series, Hell on Earth, uh, which is the 30-year war, right? Like that's what it refers to, the, the hell on earth. That's pretty helly. Yes, it's, it's a lot of hell going it's on. What, it's what we're building to. We, I mean, a little preview for people who are listening. We're not actually going to get to the war itself until episode four, but you got to lay a lot of ground groundwork. But in the, those mm-hmm. middle chunks of the thing, that's what we're really focusing on is this thirty-year, really apocalyptic conflict that take that spreads over Central Europe uh, in the middle of the seventeenth century. Well, yeah, people are going to have to go check out the podcast for that. Uh, I know the first episode's out; it's really good, and um, yeah, recommend it. And we'll plug it again at the end. So, all right. Tell us a bit about Rosicrucianism and this uh, 1614 mysterious pamphlet titled Discovery of the Fraternity of the Most Noble Order of the Rosy Cross. So the thing to know is that this is about 100 years after the Reformation starts. And by this point, you've had uh, a bunch of conflict occur. Uh, Religious wars of one type or another have roiled the entire continent. Uh, The the Holy Roman Emperor has fought the German princes in Germany. Uh, to a draw, basically. Uh, the French are having a horrifyingly violent civil war between French Protestants and the, the uh, ultra-Catholics. The Dutch are in revolt against uh, Spanish Catholic Habsburgs. But in Germany itself, by this point, there has been this sort of exhausted uh, status quo because there was a, a series of wars in the middle of the 16th century between the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and uh, the Protestant princes that ended in an agreement that whoever at that point uh, is with any religion, their domain will have that religion. Uh, Cuius regio, cuius reli- I can never say it right. Yes, cuius Whatever. regio, It's yes, a Latin phrase, religio. you can look it up. <laughs> but so the places that had been Lutheran were Lutheran. They Their churches were Lutheran. They appointed their bishops and stuff. Uh, and places that were Catholic were Catholic. Uh, and Lutheranis- Lutheranism was acknowledged as a state religion. But... So, but in one key area of the Holy Roman Empire, which was on the western part of Germany, uh, by the Rhine River, right by France and closer to Switzerland, uh, which had been much more influenced by the uh, Calvinist strain of the Reformation than Lutheranism, there was a Calvinist uh, prince, the uh, prince of the Pal- the Elector of the Palatinate, because there were seven princes among all these princes of the Holy Roman Empire who had the right to elect the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and one of them was the elector of the Palatinate in the Rhineland. Uh, and at that time, it was a young man named Frederick V uh, who was surrounded by a, a, a court full of very fervent Calvinists who were very much convinced that he was the key to breaking open uh, the remaining tyranny of the Catholic Church and uh, ushering in a new era. And just as this consensus is building, this anonymous pamphlet is released in the, the German state of Keschel, Uh, which is north of the Palatinate, uh, that has no named author uh, and is in vernacular German and is a essentially a coming out announcement by this organization called the Fraternity of the Holy Cross uh, of learned churchmen and and men of reason who lived in a city of light while also secretly living amongst the citizens of the emperor empire who understood uh, medical science who could heal the sick, who could banish illness, uh, and who were working towards the f- full illumination uh, of Christendom and the overthrow of Catholic backwardness, and that they were seeking a paladin, a, a knight to lead them. 
Uh, and and they explicitly tell the people in the pamphlet, don't come looking for us. Uh, we we are we're we're right now we're still hidden, but we will come forward uh, and we will lend lend our energies to this fight. Uh, and then a year later, another pamphlet comes out called uh, "The Confession of the Laudable Fraternity of the Most Honorable Order of the Holy Cross," written by all the learned of Europe. All of them. All of them. Mm, uh, yeah. And that one gets a little more into condemning the church uh, and also uh, uh, sketching out this this group of people who have the interest in ushering in the second coming, which is what all uh, politics really is centered on at this point. Everything is good to the degree that it's going to bring about Christ's return. And that's what the, the, these Rosicrucians promise to bring about. Uh, and the pamphlets cause a huge stir all across Germany, uh, and people start their own like little Rosicrucian groups. Like they figure, well, if they, we can't go seeking them, then maybe if we act like them, they will get into contact with us. Uh, and what's crucial is is that all of this stuff is happening also in the court of Frederick V. Like there, people in his court are reading this stuff. Uh, we still don't know how much the the court might have been involved in writing the stuff either. It, it could have been a propaganda uh, operation by the the Palatine court itself. But one way or another, within three years, when the Bohemians throw their uh, the imperial representatives out the window at the defenestration of Prague and uh, deny the Holy Roman Emperor the kingdom of Bohemia uh, and vacate the throne and start looking for someone else to take the throne, uh, Frederick is there to accept it, which is what kicks off 30 years of horrifying bloodshed in Germany. And so Rosicrucianism, I mean, did they ever figure it out? Uh, who, 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 was, who was behind it and, and did they continue to put stuff out? I mean, like, yeah, did, I want to know more about like the secret society, essentially, which <laughs> seems almost more tangible than what Q is proposing. Well, there, there's no real <laughs> proof that there was any kind of society. There, there are some uh, plausible suspects for who wrote it. Uh, I think th I, there are a couple of Lutheran churchmen who are the likely writers of it. Uh, but it was not to anyone's understanding of it. There's no evidence that it was describing any actual group. It was these people, the guys who wrote it were doing it with, I think, with the hope of instigating something, of, of, of pushing people in a direction by giving them hope that their efforts would be met, you know, that there were people who could, could support them. Uh, it, or it was a joke or and a prank. That's another theory that the whole thing was a goof and that they were doing it as a bit. Uh, they were just bored and 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 uh, like looking for a good time. <laughs> there is one more pamphlet that came out after this uh, called "The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz." Rosenkreuz, uh, and that is a, it's just a description, an, an allegor heavily a heavily allegorical description of a guy being led on a boat to this fantasy city of light where he uh, has a wedding ceremony uh, and the whole thing is it's essentially in code uh, and, and it, with the assumption that the learned mind would be able to find what the symbolism represents and then use it to further unlock the key to uh, revelation. That one could decipher the drop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You could bake it up. You would think this stuff, you know, wouldn't have that much influence, but I mean, I've, we've covered the, you know, order of the solar temple there were still, you know, kind of murder cults springing up in Europe in like the as late as the 90s and probably up until this day that have, you know, uh, weird connections with the Rosicrucians and and their various kind of offshoots that that are like very, they're very much still there. And like were kind of brought back into view in the 70s uh, during the New Age um, like resurgence. Well, that's that's so interesting. What's so interesting to me about the idea that this idea of a Rosicrucian group could potentially have just been a propaganda effort by people surrounding, you know, a, a Protestant princely movement in the middle of the 17th century, because it then becomes this tautological thing whereby inventing the idea of a secret society of learned men that are attempting to bring about essentially the storm. Yeah. Uh, that then for 400 years since you have had people inspired by that idea, essentially trying to do it themselves you know, and this even will dovetail into, you know, maybe not directly, but this kind of thinking dovetails into things like Masonic traditions mm -hmm. a, a century oh, yeah. later mm -hmm. uh, and, and various other secret societies that have, you know, been a part of European and then New World American culture uh, ever since. But, you know, it, it is all sprinting out of this movement to push 
this 17th century uh, European culture into what everybody assumed was happening, which was which was that was going to happen imminently, the end of days, some yeah. kind of final confrontation that you know th- this this idea that the old world will be destroyed and a new perfected world will be created imminently yeah in their in people's lifetimes and perhaps all people needed was a little push and it is wild like if rosicrucianism did not really exist before the pamphlets and there really is no evidence that it did it definitely did afterwards and you can like if you can trace a line from the people who were inspired by the rosicrucian pamphlets to the scientific revolution, like the, mm-hmm. the, the people who established the uh, the Royal uh, Society in England that does a lot of the work of like codifying our understanding of, you know, scientific uh, process were people who were some way or another connected to Rosicrucian and occult groups that sprung up after the publication of the pamphlets. So you have real magic here, like a real conjuring into existence something that did not exist beforehand. And the the instrument of it, the real magical crucible, is the printing press because you are engaging now with a population who can see in a printed material a reality and to take on faith the reality of what they're reading just as much as they would do with the things they see every day around them. And that leads them to act in a way that you know, brings into existence things that would otherwise be impossible to conceive of. This is the birth of pilling. This is, you know, I'm, I'm trying to imagine like what a totally sleepless addict to like the pamphlets would be like. Would he be like <laughs> up at dawn waiting for the print house to open on the day he knows a new pamphlet's about to drop? <laughs> I mean, another element of this that we talk about in the series is... The interplay between, you know, it's it's a little adjac- adjacent or tangential to it, but I think it's an interesting element here is the the role of kind of alchemists and occult philosophers in the courts of Europe at this time. Uh, and as Matt was saying, it's like at this moment, you know, the uh, scientific inquiry and occult in- inquiry are basically the same thing. And a lot of the people you see uh, working these kinds of inquiries, searching for things like the Philosopher's Stone, um, are also very plugged into this idea of like like the whole idea of the philosopher's stone and alchemy it, it it's all uh also wrapped up in immunitizing this end of days uh like revelatory moment and in the process of doing these investigations of trying to turn base metals into gold and stuff like that as part of a larger religious program of creating a you know helping to to create or reify their personal monarch into a universal monarch or, or something like that they are uh, spending sleepless nights deciphering these tomes or Kabbalistic texts, trying to read the Bible backwards and upside down to find the mathematical principle that will prove the existence of the Philosopher's Stone and stuff like that. I mean, it is very much, you know, a recognizable uh, impulse that we would see in the same thing as, you know, deciphering drops or whatever. But also at the same time, they're making genuine scientific uh, advancements. They're figuring out new ways of, uh, t- of smelting copper that will be used for hundreds of years. They're making genuine advancements in in um, pyrotechnic technology and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, in, in 1669, this guy Henning Brandt discovered phosphorus by boiling a giant flask of urine for months on end. Now, <laughs> he wouldn't have done that if he didn't think that he was going to create the Philosopher's Stone. He wasn't going to meet like <laughs> angels who were going to suck him off and tell him that he was a good guy. There's no other reason to boil a giant flask of piss, but he did it. And then one day it started glowing in the dark. <laughs> and that that is magic. And that's one of the funny things about, you know, to go all the way back to Luther, one of the things about Luther's yes. life and works I was say. that's that's so kind of ironically funny is that, you know, so Luther's main thing is like looking at the structures of the the millennia built up structures and rituals of the Catholic Church and then reading the Bible and saying these two things don't match. And I can read the Bible and I can make my own interpretation of the Bible. And through reading the Bible and making my own interpretation, I have come up with this truth that I now present to you, you, the public, to free you from this. And this idea that he gives out is you can read the Bible and come to your own conclusions. And then immediately a bunch of other people start reading the Bible and coming to their own conclusions and, you know, further reforming the church. And Luther's like, no, 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 wait, 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 stop. You can't do that. I already did it. Yeah. I, I did the, the, the reading and reinterpretation <laughs> of the Bible and came to the correct yep. conclusion. Y- yeah. you there's no further way to yeah. go and I mean, in that in that respect luther was uh did not understand something that the the uh, many of the catholic uh, theologians and leaders did because they said they ex- were explicit people should not be reading the bible this is dangerous it is dangerous to give common people 
this book because they're going to start coming to their own conclusions and they're going to be their own conclusions. What Luther was very confident, no, once people hear my interpretation, which is it's, it's it, it resonates with me and therefore is true, that it's going to become universalized. And it, that was instantly disproven. And, and it just opened this, yes, this Pandora's box of, of interpretation. And all of a sudden you've got peasants in Southern Germany who've been getting just completely screwed over by uh, the uh, reimposition of feudal power in an attempt to wring more from them in, a, in, a, in an era of declining agriculture, who uh, decide, actually, this all this stuff means that we don't have to listen to any of these motherfuckers. And you see Luther sort of helping inspire uh, this peasant war that starts in 16, uh, 1525 uh, that spreads throughout a huge chunk of Germany uh, and which Luther writes... Uh, a, a screed in condemnation of where he says against the looting murdering horde of peasants and he he calls for the rightful authorities of the empire to crush them and that ends up costing him a lot of his popular base uh, after he publishes that book he actually gets uh, thrown rocks thrown at him uh, <laughs> at one public appearance uh, but he of course writes to his friend you know what uh I think I did the right thing. And if they don't agree, then that's because they don't know. And I do. Then suck it. <laughs> the way you describe Martin Luther, he seems like a kind of a naive, obnoxious uh, logic and reason guy where he just believes is if he lays out his argument and he cites the text and he cites his sources, then clearly people will all fall in line behind him because he, he, he has presented an airtight case and no one with a functioning mind who is morally good could possibly deviate from its conclusions. Yes, but of course, as with all these people, that logical progression is based on an absolute volcano of personal emotion. Like yes. he is wildly emotionally uh, attached. Like he is his his relationship to God is this is this constant struggle of of alienation and fear and love. Uh, and and the the formula that he creates is how he negotiates those emotions. But those are his emotions, you know. Uh, and it is his, his, his naivete, I guess you'd put it, to assume that that would translate to other people who've had other experiences. He does that colloquy, is it with Zwingli? Yeah, Zwingli. Uh, where, oh, on the re Eucharist. Yeah, where they're debating the Eucharist because, you know, part of his... Part of his bit is that these uh, seven sacraments that are prescribed by the church don't really have certain ones of them don't have certain biblical justifications and that we should do away with them. And then that's immediately taken forward by the Calvinist reformers or the uh, even further reformers like Zwingli to be like, well, the Eucharist shouldn't exist either. There's there's no biblical justification for that. And he has, Luther has this colloquy with it where he's arguing in favor of it, even though all of his other arguments based on logic say that these things, you know, shouldn't exist. And Zwingli's like, so wait, 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 wait. All of your logic holds except your one argument of because you feel it's true, it shouldn't be, it, yeah. it should still exist. And, and yeah. Martin Luther has to admit, yeah, basically, because yeah. I feel it to be true. In my yeah. heart, yeah. it should still be around. I, I but still, I, I'm right. I'm uh, right about yeah, yeah. everything else. I, I yeah, feel right. a a true presence in the Eucharist. Like he didn't, he did not believe in the full transubstantiation of the Catholic Church, but he believed that there was a real presence in the Eucharist. And the Zwingliites and then the later Calvinists, they went, they might hold on to uh, it, but that their insistence was, this is just bread, this is just wine. It has no because otherwise you're shitting God, and they can't have that. <laughs> they can't like I mean, that's fair because they take the logic thing to the next level of yeah. logic. Like that's Kelvin's deal is to drain religion, train emotion from the entire process, or or at least to create a fully like logically structured a relationship with God that can replace that uh, the the uh, subjective religious experience that uh, that previous generations had held. And so they insisted on there's no presence of anything in the Eucharist. Uh, but Luther, even though at this time, the whole project depended on unity and, and splitting with, with the Swiss only undermined their greater interest in resisting Catholicism, uh, he just couldn't do it. He could not bring himself to deny the real presence that he felt in the Eucharist. And I think that that is kind of, an, it is, right, Travis, like an eternal archetype of very often that beneath these uh, the kind of hardcore facts and logics guy, guys, you can really you can really pull out this very palpable sense of a quivering emotion, like a um, emotional figure on an edge. And I'm thinking of somebody here, like a like maybe a Jordan B. Peterson type, where mm, oh god, yeah, <laughs> where you know his 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 presentation is these these are real truths that can be arrived at through 
only the power of the mind and logic, but you can feel beneath it the the fervent, quivering, emotional tempest that that generates that need to put it all into a logical uh, lattice, a logical framework at every moment. Yeah. I mean, I think he's recreated at the very least the constipation just from benzos and meat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, there, there, you there go. is a, a it similar. Is the amount of the amount of not shitting. I mean, that was <laughs> key to a lot of uh, medieval and early modern uh, politics. Is that at the highest, at the higher social levels here, these people are never shitting because <laughs> peasant diets during this period are largely grain based. They're basically eating grain, a little yeah. bit of vegetables and fruit, uh, but. One of the marks of high status is that you're basically eating meat for every meal. So these guys <laughs> were never shitting. <laughs> Wait, the guys at the top were never yeah, shitting? Yeah, no, no, no. That was yeah. what yes. they were eating. Yeah. yeah. So they, yeah, so they didn't have to, you know, figure out whatever the equivalent of wiping was. They didn't have to deal with that. They didn't have to deal with the storage of lots of shit. I'm thinking back to. I mean, if you're at the top, someone, uh, you're going into the shitting room and you're probably just shitting on the carpet, and someone look, else has to come in and clean look, it. Look, my understanding of shitting at this time is basically basically traced back to uh, uh, Stephen Beastly's uh, incredible cross sections okay. where where they have the pictures <laughs> of the castles, and <laughs> me and my little brother would always be like, "Oh, and that's where all the shit is." They would have uh-huh. it illustrate. Yeah. And nobody else read these? Okay. This is way before our time period, but there is a great moment in German history where a... Um, oh, the Airfoot Latrine disaster. I think this is in the 1100s or 1200s. 1200s, yeah. Where uh, a German prince as- assembles all of his it's, uh, it's nobles. It's the electors. The, it's, yeah. It was like, it was it was the meeting of the of the top uh, uh, princes of the Holy Roman Empire. They met at Airfoot, Germany. And they uh, they meet in the big meeting room, which is a uh, old wooden floor, and they all get in there, and the floor collapses and fifty in, directly into the latrine, <laughs> and 50 of them drown to death. And liquid <laughs> shit. Oh my god! Uh, but, yeah, that's cool. Man. Yes. That's the first sliming, dude. That's some Nickelodeon fun. Oh my goodness! This set us on the course that we're on now. The thing is, back back forward is like every top leader that you read about in this period is basically they're basically all beset by debilitating hemorrhoids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, yeah. like to the point where like multiple Holy Roman empires need to be like ca- mostly carried around. Emperors need to be carried around on litters because yeah. they like can't walk right because of their hemorrhoids. They got it's, hemorrhoids. They got gout. Yeah, and this is all from eating nothing but meat. Yes, it's it's a bit it's a big deal among the uh, noble class of the period. That's amazing, and the modern masculinity influencers. So we've we've come full circle. Yes, exactly. They're trying yeah. to re- recreate that uh, that noble tradition in all the wrong ways. I mean, that is a, pretty explicitly <laughs> what they what they're fantasizing about. That's the v- return mm-hmm. that they yep. want to do is to the promise of uh, of uh, universal uh, uh, aristocracy mm-hmm. that America originally uh, dangled in front of uh, immigrants. I believe that we but, will one day not shit but at didn't, all. <laughs> didn't like Liver King say that like because of his diet like he shits so cleanly that like he doesn't have to wipe. He doesn't something. have to wipe which is, <laughs> which is a lie because he doesn't shit. <laughs> He said he doesn't do steroids either. I mean, I don't know if I yeah. buy any yeah. of the Liver well, King Yeah, selling. I guess that's true. He had to. He, he was caught, man. He was caught. He had to admit it. He did like a mea culpa. What if he also in that press release had to be like, and yes, my my shits are messy. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I can't. I, I, I got to use lie. half a roll. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, so you, you spoke there briefly of Germany, but during the 30-year war, you mentioned there were some witch panics as well, so some proper, like, satanic panic stuff. Was that, like, the Catholics saying there's a Protestant witch, or was this, like, a third group of, of women that were neither, uh, you know, of these kind of religious persuasions fighting each other in the war? Well, it happened in both Protestant and Ger- uh, Catholic areas, although most of the most uh, the most intense witch panics happened in places that, that had been Protestant and that were being re-Catholicized. Uh, and th- th- that's because, while well, you had grassroots witch panics all throughout this area, because it's the end of the world. I mean, yes. as we were saying, like this is a nightmare descending on the world, and someone has to take the blame. And, of course, there's no political mechanism to point the blame upward, so it can only be a search for scapegoats within a community. And it's not cloaked in um, confessional language. It's not like, oh, you're secretly a Protestant. It's, no, you're in league with the devil. You're, forget all the religious bullshit. You are just direct in contact with Satan. You signed his book. You're, you're, you're doing Congress with him. You're doing rituals to make men's dicks not work. Uh, and... 
So there was that kind of accus those kinds of accusations were flying everywhere. The places where they led to large scale persecutions and burnings and torture is where local authorities took them seriously. Mm -hmm. And that tended to be places where uh, local authorities had an interest in using the witch panics, using the procedures of them to undermine resistance to their imposition of rule. Uh, so it, it was instrumentalized by, by power wherever power saw it as useful in places where local authorities felt secure and uh, were uh, threatened by this. Because there was always a risk when you start uh, taking seriously these accusations that somebody important is going to get accused. And so it's always a danger of undermining existing authority. So in a lot of spots, mm -hmm. uh, the local authorities would put a lid on it and say, nope, we're not talking. Nope, we're not doing that. So the confessional uh, relationship did shape it. But it was largely, uh, uh, its extent was determined by the response of the local elites. Uh, and it was also something that was spurred by the printing press. Because uh, by this time, the malus maleficarium, the hammer of witches, uh, had been uh, through dozens of uh, printings and had been around for uh, generations. Uh, and it was considered by many uh, literate people uh, in, in Germany to be the manual for understanding what witchcraft was, how to identify it, and then how to prosecute it. And it was the product of this uh, Catholic priest named Kramer who was kicked out of town for being too uh, fer fervid of a witch accuser at a time when witch trials were relatively rare. And then he said, well, I'll prove, I'll show you. And he wrote this book, which was never accepted by the Catholic Church, but which became sort of a de facto manual in a lot of the courts of the time and in a lot of, in a lot of the, the secular courts. And so, you know, it creates this body of pseudo-knowledge that becomes what people refer to when the, when horror comes to their community and they need to make sense of it. And during the Thirty Years' War, it's uh, in one specific region in southern Germany, uh, I forget the exact town right now, uh, in the late 1620s where this really kicks up, and it basically becomes one of these things where, again, it's a, a recently re-Catholicized area, um, and it is supported by the local authorities, and it becomes one of these things that once you start taking it seriously at a local authority level, it becomes kind of an exponential process, uh, and especially once you accept that anyone in the community can be targeted. So in the, the places that it really sprung up, they accepted that all up and down the social ladder from li literally like, you know, the, the fattest, the wealthiest. I was looking through some of the records of the burnings, and it would be like the fattest man in town, the wealthiest man in town's wife. Some people we don't know that we found on the street outside town. It, it's like literally everyone from like be beggars to the top. And the way that they would go through these investigations is you basically get accused of being a witch. They bring you in to the specially built witch prison that they made in this town. They torture you until you admitted to being a witch and then tortured you until you led them through town and pointed out the five other people you knew were witches. And so in that oh. way, it became this exponential panic that each person Jesus that got accused Christ. led inevitably through torture to five more people getting accused who then themselves led to five more people getting accused. And it basically became, became yeah, a, a, a panic in a place that burned for a period of time until even higher authorities, I believe the, the, the emperor had to come in and shut it down, uh, you know, <laughs> said that we, we can't yeah. let this go on, go on any longer. But yeah, it, it is this ramification of this crisis coming to town or being be, beset on, on these areas without any individual recourse in any political web. Mm -hmm. So shifting for a moment from Germany to England, who were the fifth monarchists? Uh, so that's another Q-esque group. I, I think of them in, in similar ways. So the, uh, the English Civil War happens uh, around, it, it's, it, it's concomitant with the Thirty Years' War. It starts, the, it starts with the Bishops' Wars as the Thirty Years' War is in the middle of its third uh, century or third decade. Uh, and it continues until after uh, the Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, and it results in the establishment of this, this commonwealth led by Oliver Cromwell. And the people who, the parliament that uh, carried it out were, were all, were largely Puritans, which was the, what they called the strictest Calvinists uh, in England. And they were, of course, you know, all seeking the end of days like every other good Christian was. Uh, and this one segment of them, which included people who were highly placed in the army and in parliament, uh, decided that uh, they 
we're bringing about the fifth monarchy because there is in the book of Daniel, which is one of the apocalyptic prophecy books, it describes how four empires must rise and fall before Christ's return. And the, the fourth, fifth monarch. Yeah. And the fourth monarchy was Rome. And of course, they're talking about, you know, Rome, Rome. Uh, and, but, the, but in the 1650s, they looked at their Bible and they decided, oh, uh, when we executed Charles, uh, when we killed, because they, they beheaded the king of England, Charles I, when we executed Charles, we ended the fourth monarchy, which means we are initiating the fifth monarchy and that we are bringing about uh, Christ's return. And a lot of them looked at Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell, who was not a fifth monarchist, but was super sympathetic to them to a degree. I mean, in, because they thought he was Moses. They thought he was going to bring them to the promised land. Uh, but then when... Uh, the, his government failed over and over again to create any sort of stable uh, legislative machinery. They uh, became disillusioned with Cromwell, and they have, well, some of their leaders eventually staged an abortive revolt against him, uh, which was pretty easily repressed. And then the last gasp was another revolt that happened after the return of uh, the Stuarts. Uh, but yeah, th like they were the most uh, apocalyptic minded of the that revolutionary generation and they also had a couple of failed uh <laughs> failed failed low-level coups yeah, yeah failed insurrections yeah but it is interesting like the rosicrucians you know who would have been you know 30 years before mm -hmm. that you find in many of these courts highly you know these leaders cromwell frederick v who are surrep may not themselves be a party to these thoughts but find themselves surrounded by people all pushing in a direction that is heavily heavily influenced by a thought process of apocalyptic restoration mm -hmm. that they will that they the leaders are being influenced by people who are convinced that their sovereign is going to be the one to usher in the end of days and the restoration of a new uh heavenly kingdom on earth geotis yeah, everybody just wants to be standing in the circle when the sky opens up. Oh, I'm down. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I mean, what's what's the alternative? You just die alone? That sucks. Yeah, yeah, that's no fun. Yeah. Yeah, before the printed word, it was even more grim. At least you could read, like, I don't know, some some diss track by Martin Luther in, around this period, you know? <laughs> yeah, what else were you yes. doing at the time? Like, talking about, like, how bad it smelled and, like, if yeah. you were going to, like, eat enough? And, like... Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> So, guys, yeah, tell us a little bit about what led you to creating Hell on Earth and what people could expect from the series. The show is my suggestion, uh, and at the top level, why I thought about it uh, is because it's cool mm -hmm. and fun. Uh, and <laughs> the board itself has a lot of cool, wacky characters in it and a bunch of uh, gnarly battles. Uh, and It's really complicated, and there's a lot to dig into just like figuring out how to tell the story of it but then as you know we started conceiving of that we looked into it and found all the stuff that we're talking about now all these resonances with uh a current moment and that goes from all of the stuff that we're here on your show to talk about all this uh, the ideas that we find resonant with you know your topic matter of this new communication medium causing a revolution in the way that people conceive of themselves conceive of information conceive of their ability to find and process new information in a way that makes them consider themselves to be the smartest people uh, that the earth has ever produced but then also you know it is all of this social ferment is in the aftermath of one of the worst plagues that the world has ever seen. There is a climate factor to this. One of the this entire period or the Thirty Years' War takes place during and immediately after a um, climate event known as the Little Ice Age, in which the world got noticeably colder uh, for a period. Uh, and this comes from a variety of factors, uh, including uh, a measured diminishing of sunspots at the time, like adding to the apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic fervor of the moment, the sun literally got dimmer. <laughs> uh, and then there's also, it, it is theorized that it could have, an, the Little Ice Age could have an anthropogenic cause in the idea that uh, new world contact had just been made, and suddenly, because of disease, like 90 percent... 50 million hectares or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like 50 million hectares of cultivated land in the new world's returned to wilderness, uh, which could have created a, a carbon sink of types uh, affecting global climate. But basically, because of this, uh, the winter got much longer in Northern Europe, and uh, crop it, it caused massive agricultural fail failures, which led to this moment of increased social uh, dislocation. And then on top of this all, you have these, across Europe, these these sovereigns and political entities that are engaged in this 
uh, critical crisis of gridlock and authority, that, that the previous uh, structure of feudalism was no longer a workable uh, social and economic project in Europe. And maybe Matt, Matt can talk about that, that element for a second. Yeah, because you have an acute crisis hitting a totally stagnant political world. They only knew uh, how to sustain their social world through the practice of feudal uh, uh, expropriation at a time when the agricultural underpinnings of that were dissolving in front of their faces. And uh, so they reacted really the only way they could, which was by trying to uh, jockey for power and position amongst themselves and and to wage war. And in the process of waging that war, they were building these structures of social and economic power that end up totally uh, overthrowing the power that they were trying to uh, protect, but without anybody uh, in power explicitly seeking that outcome. And I think that that's what really resonates for me about the current moment and the way that it relates is that they created a world that we're now living at the end of in the sense that we have reached, like the, the capitalism that was unleashed by that process has reached now global totality the way that uh, and global hegemony and now is is entering into a similar uh, exogenous crisis generated by it and is similarly incapable of self-correction but they thought they were living through the end of the world and they were but they were living through the end of one world and i think that we get fixated on the apocalypse but like it's always the world's always ending and a new world is always being built and i think that's what uh, i think is most interesting about studying this is just watching how while people were trying to bring about the actual end of days, they were building an entirely new world that their descendants would live in and which would be fully alien to them, but which is still uh, a hu the part of the human pageant and that that's what we're in the, we are still, we're locked in that same process as well. Uh, plus arquebuses, halberds, uh gustavus adolphus uh you know just cool <laughs> army stuff Three, three weapons Forks. it's it's cool because it's the military action in the 30 years war is wild because it's got still it has a lot of remnants of high medieval warfare you've got suits of guys are still wearing the full suits of armor okay you know they've got maces and flails and, and war hammers but they've yeah. also got uh, uh muskets They've also got cannons. It's this uh, hybrid uh, beast, this transitional uh, fossil of, of military science. Uh, and watching the people like try to come to terms with it is fascinating. And one of the guys who does the most with that is th this fucking Swedish dude, Gustavus Adolphus, who just comes roaring across the Baltic and just owning everyone for over a year uh, during this period that saw Sweden as one of the great powers of Europe with its own colonies in the United States. So that's, you know, a lot of stuff there. But the main point is there's a lot of stuff going on a lot in, of this, stuff in this series that we're hoping yeah. to, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, get, hook people in with the, the uh, you know, the sword and sorcery kind of Game of Thrones stuff. But really what we're trying to get across is that this world and our world, they're not so different. You Indeed. Know? Absolutely. And, and where can people find uh, the series and where should they go? Uh, the first episode of Hell on Earth is now out uh, for free on the Chapo Trap House uh, free feed. Uh, free, ad-free, available to everyone. L you can listen to it uh, right now at soundcloud.com slash Chapo Trap House. Uh, we also have a great little mini site that our wonderful designer, John White, put together. If you want to find all the information about it, including the first episode linked right there on the site. That's And an interactive atlas, because goddamn describing how the Holy Roman Empire works is almost impossible over audio <laughs> medium. So we have a map right there that you can click on, find out yeah. all about like where things were and who was associated with which realm uh, and find the podcast and find our about and our credits. That's hell on earth. com. That's probably where I should direct people to all subsequent episodes of the show, which will be nine more narrative episodes where we in a kind of scripted way, lay out the rest of the, the story we wanted to tell. And then we're going to do a, a few interview episodes afterwards that dig into specific themes with some experts in the field. Um, all of those will be on exclusively for subscribers to Chapo Trap House on our Patreon, patreon.com slash Chapo Trap House. So uh, subscribe today if you want to listen to the rest of the series. It's going to be great. 
Can you do like Google Street View on the map to see the hemorrhoids? Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know they they tend to leave those out of the uh, the court portraits uh, that they paint of these guys. Yeah, Cromwell famously asked uh, for his portrait to be made warts and all, but he did not specify anal ones. <laughs> <laughs> The website's great. The The series is really well put together, and I look forward to to following it as it uh, progresses across the, the 10 episodes, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, fellas, thanks so much for coming on. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hell on Earth comes out every Wednesday, and you can go check it out at patreon.com slash chopotraphouse. Thank you for listening to another episode of the QAnon Anonymous podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash QAnon Anonymous and subscribe for five bucks a month to get a whole second episode every week, plus access to our entire archive of premium episodes. And when you sub, you help us stay advertising free and editorially independent. For everything else, we've got a website, QAnonAnonymous.com. Listener, until next week, may the Halle Baird uh, through Julian Skull bless you and keep you. It's not like Haley Berry. It's like Halbert, I think. Halbert? Okay, hold on. No, too late. Listen, I'm putting this in. Listener, until next <laughs> week, uh, may the iron great sword of eternal flame uh, through Julian Skull bless you and keep you. <laughs> it's not a conspiracy. Yeah, it's a fact. And now, now today's, today's auto Very few people understand the truth about who founded the world's Western secret societies and why. Google will try to tell you that they're just a bunch of glorified fraternities, nothing to worry about. Some conspiracy theorists say they began as a way to enslave the world with black magic. Here's what really happened. For thousands of years, sacred knowledge of the universe was carefully preserved in ancient mystery schools. Until egomaniac rulers, kings, despots, popes, emperors, realized that the best way to gain and maintain power was to capture or erase that knowledge. In order to preserve and protect ancient traditions, mystics and wise men were forced into hiding under the cover of some of these organizations, like the Knights Templar or the Rosicrucians. During what we now refer to as the Dark Ages, these men, including Dante, Da Vinci, and Galileo, were the keepers of the light. That is, until the secret societies were infiltrated. But that's another story.